OK, so here are the answers to the questions at the end of the previous chapter. So why don't you pause the video while you tick them off and you can carry on with the next chapter, which is... Interdependence, Adaptation and Environmental Change. Competition, plants compete for light, space, water and nutrients and animals compete for mates, food and territory. Animal adaptations. Now, a term you're expected to know is extremophiles. This means extreme loving. So these are organisms that are adapted to tolerate extreme levels of various environmental conditions. For example, extreme levels of salt or temperature or pressure. Dry and arctic environments may need special adaptations. For example, to survive in the Arctic, animals need a small surface area to volume ratio to reduce heat loss. They may need a thick coat for insulation to reduce heat loss. They may need a thick fat layer, again for insulation, to reduce heat loss. They may need camouflage to avoid being seen. Now watch out in the question, quite often it will ask you to describe the adaptation and to explain how that adaptation helps the animal to survive. So, how does a small surface area to volume ratio help the animal? It reduces heat losses. So that's the underlying bit there in each phrase. Examples of animals adapted in this way are the Arctic fox and the polar bear. Plant adaptations now, some plants are adapted to live in very dry environments, but these require special adaptations for the plant. So an example is reduced surface area to reduce evaporation. So by this, they'll have very tiny leaves, or in the case of the cactus, which is our example here, their leaves will be reduced to simple spines, so there's less evaporation. They'll need large root systems, which extend a long way underground. This enables them to collect more water and they'll need water storage tissues, for example a swollen stem that after a rainfall is able to take up a lot of water and expand and this allows survival during long periods of drought. Living organisms may have adaptations for other reasons, for example to allow them to deter predators, to stop being eaten. Plants, for example, may grow thorns or spikes to avoid being eaten. For example, brambles. Animals and plants may use poisonous chemicals to avoid being eaten. For example, box plants, which you might find in your garden as part of a hedgerow, they're poisonous. There you go, here's bramble at the top. Look at the size of those spikes. That'll stop them being eaten. And box plants. These are poisonous, that'll stop them being eaten too. Animals and plants have lots of other strategies to avoid being eaten. They may use warning colours to suggest danger, for example wasps and bees. Their yellow and black stripes warn other animals. If you come near me you're likely to get a nasty sting, so they tend to be left alone. Or mimicry which is the appearance of a dangerous organism. For example, hoverflies, they're very common in our gardens. They look like wasps. They've got yellow and black stripes. They're completely harmless, but other animals think that they'll get a nasty sting off them, so they leave them alone. Here you go, warning colorations. There's a lovely bee pollinating my runner beans. So here's a picture of a hoverfly. Now, it's quite difficult to get a good photo of them because they don't stay still very long. But you can just make out that the abdomen is yellow coloured with black stripes on it. And other creatures mistake them for wasps. So they tend to leave them alone even though they're completely harmless. And actually gardeners like them because they're very beneficial predators of nasty bugs in the garden. Changes in the environment. Now, if certain factors in the environment change,
then this may cause changes in the distribution of different species. And what that means, changes in distribution, is changes in where they're found. Species have to move home. For example, temperature and rainfall may change as part of global climate change. This may cause some organisms to lose their habitat or lose their home. So some species may have to move elsewhere, maybe their normal habitat has suddenly become too dry, so they may find that they're moving further north, away from the equator. Or a new competitor or a new predator may move into their habitat and that may affect their distribution. An example of an organism that's being affected by changes in the environment is the bees. There's a drop in bee numbers. How do we monitor changes in the environment? Well, we can use living pollution indicators. We can look at different organisms and see if they're living in a habitat. There are some organisms which are very sensitive to things like pollution. So if we find these sensitive organisms in a habitat, then that suggests to us that the habitat has very low levels of pollution. And an example of one of these is lichen, the fluffy stuff that grows on tree bark. Lichen can be used to monitor air pollution, especially sulphur dioxide. It's very sensitive and it won't grow where the levels of pollution are very high. This is lichen, the greeny grey flaky stuff that grows on tree bark. It's got a very large surface area to volume ratio, so if there is pollution present in the air it tends to absorb a lot. So this is very sensitive to air pollution. We can also monitor pollution in water by looking at invertebrates which are living in water. Certain species of invertebrates are very sensitive to pollution in water, particularly to the concentration of dissolved oxygen. Polluted water tends to have very low levels of dissolved oxygen, so invertebrates struggle to survive. They don't have enough oxygen for respiration. Non-living factors can also be measured using special equipment. So, for example, we can measure oxygen concentrations using an oxygen meter, which is a little handheld device with a probe on it. Of course, we can use a thermometer to measure the temperature and rain gauges to measure the rainfall. OK, so that's the end of this chapter. Hopefully you've printed off all the notes, so you can have a go at these questions now. You'll find the answers at the beginning of the next chapter. Good luck!